This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. On Uncommon Knowledge today, Christopher Hitchens, the author of the best-selling book, God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything, which indeed is such a big bestseller that you can do what I did and walk into your local bookstore and get it off the bestseller rack for 30% off. If Christopher Hitchens does not believe in God, reviewers have asked, then where does he get his sense of right and wrong? You have replied, in print, that this question is in itself insulting, and you have rejected, quote, the appalling insinuation that I would not know right from wrong if I was not supernaturally guided, close quote. Why do you find it insulting? Because I think it's degrading to, to the human, to us, to you and me, to imply, well, not to imply, to state directly that uh, absent a celestial dictatorship that had some supernatural influence over us, yet to be established, by the way, as, as anything really existent, but without the assumption of it, we wouldn't know right from wrong. Uh, we wouldn't return stolen property if we found it in the back of a cab. We wouldn't give blood if someone badly needed a transfusion, unless we were afraid either of reward, uh, either of punishment or desirous of a reward, uh, that we might help ourselves to underage uh, children, as some religious people have actually been uh, known to do. Um, because, after all, what's stopping us? Now, you could tell me, if you wanted, that you would do all those things if you weren't God-fearing. But I would choose not to believe you. I have more respect for you, if not for your opinions, than that. All right, Jonathan Swift. It, 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 not just reviewers of your book, but Jonathan Swift is at least aware of this argument. Uh, he has an essay in which he has a country yokel listening to the arguments of an atheist and then declaring, quote, why, sir, if it be as you say, I can drink and whore and defy the parson. So far, so good. <laughs> Close quote. But if there is no God, if there is no objective ground of right and wrong, from what do you derive your morals? From what do you Actually, derive the, right it, and wrong? The stupidest person in um, Smeryakov, I think it is, in the Brothers Karamazov says, mm -hmm. that he turns out himself to be uh, a very moral person, he says, but, but with, without God wouldn't everything be permitted. That's the sense of what he said. Right, right. By the way, I think some people who say this may fear it to be true of themselves. I mean, some people who are psycho or sociopathic may conceivably have this, the view that only superstition restrains them from cruelty, theft, rapine, violence, mm -hmm. utter uh, uh, selfishness and so forth. But I, I don't believe it's true first. I think our, right. our knowledge of right and wrong is innate in us. Religion gets its morality from humans. We know that we can't get along if we permit perjury, theft, murder, rape. All societies at all times, well before the advent of monotheism, certainly, have forbidden it. If morality, a sense of morality, is another adaptive or evolved faculty, the problem is that there are all kinds of things that we're stuck with as a result of evolution, if one posits evolution. So you feel biological urges, you feel you feel the impulse to steal, and you, yet at the same time you have some kind of in, innate morality that tells you not to steal. So the question is, w with a religious point of view, it gives you some way, you say there's an objective standard according to which we can, uh, we, we, we recognize that certain, um, certain of these impulses are acceptable and certain other impulses are to be disciplined and restrained and so forth. I don't understand how if you take it all as, as a kind of evolutionary, uh, resu result of evolution, let's put it that way, how it is that you can say morality is over and above other urges. How do you do that? Well, uh, two observations. Oh. One, I mentioned in my book a Muslim taxi driver right. in Washington, D.C., who returned quite a lot of money that my wife had left on the back of his cab. It must have taken him quite a while to work out whose it was, whose it was right? where she lived, where he dropped her off. To come back into town, he lived in the burbs, uh, right. losing quite a lot of labor and time and effort in, just in doing that, to return mm -hmm. what I can tell you would be more than he probably could hope to make in a week. And he wouldn't take, he wouldn't even take the 10% I wanted to give him because I really obviously crammed it into his top pocket. He really wouldn't, thought it was insulting almost, because he said it was his Islamic duty. Now, as it happens, I think, and I, su I suspect you think too, mm -hmm. that most of the preachments of the Quran are either fatuous or uh, wicked. And they enjoin evil on many people, um, and they claim to believe in things that are, shouldn't be believed in on sheer grounds of absurdity, such as 
the Archangel Gabriel appearing to an illiterate Arab merchant or a night journey to Jerusalem on a winged horse or any of this nonsense. Mm -hmm. But for him, without it, he couldn't imagine being moral. Well, I'm sorry, I think that's insulting too. Now, to take something that isn't necessarily evolutionary or, mm -hmm. or determined by, in the crude terms you suggest, if I'm making a speech right. and I make a cheap point to get a laugh, which I'm not above doing, I can do that, or, or I skip a stage in an argument you know, to make a, an inexpensive point, and especially if it works, and I get the laugh, I, I feel a pang. I think, oh, oh, do you? Yeah, it, it, especially if it works. Why is this? Um, not to be grand about it, but the, well, Socrates, this is what Socrates called his daemon. It was an inner voice that stopped him when he was trying to take advantage of someone in an argument, wrongly. Um, Adam Smith calls it uh, the sort of un unspoken partner in conversation who we hope to, whose approval we hope to get. Lewis calls it conscience and says it's proof of the existence of God. That's stretching it enormously further than it will go. Why mm. don't we just assume that we do have some internal compass mm. and that if we didn't, we couldn't be um, the partially rational mammals that we are. Rational. All right. That, this brings us on to this. Okay. By the way, I'm, all of that seems, I'm delighted to see that we're making progress here, Christopher. I'm bringing you along. The, um, so your argument is then that when the taxi driver returned your wife's money, that was the human shining through in spite of the religious overlay. I would say, yeah. All right. I, I believe if we define conscience as you were about to, or morality as you were about to, um, my definition would be what do you, what do you do, how do you do something when, you th when no one's looking? Okay. Now, now, in this case, he could easily have got away with it. Right, of course. Didn't, but he, didn't, he couldn't live with himself if he did. Well, who doesn't have that feeling? And uh, why do we degrade this feeling by saying it's a, it's a heavenly gift right. uh, accompanied by a threat of heavenly punishment? You raise the question of um, rationality. Lewis makes the point, quote, granted that reason is prior to matter, that, as it is in most religious, in religious outlets, certainly in the Judeo-Christian conception. Granted that reason is prior to matter, I can understand how men should come by observation and inference to know a lot about the universe they live in. If, on the other hand, minds are wholly dependent on brains and brains on biochemistry and biochemistry on the meaningless flux of atoms, that is to say, if there's nothing but material, this is the materialistic worldview, I cannot understand how the thought of those minds should have in any more significance than the sound of the wind in the trees." Close quote. Set aside questions of right and wrong and pangs of conscience to the question of reason itself. If you have a thoroughgoing materialist view of the world, doesn't that, doesn't that tend to represent an attack on reason itself? Or at least lower, why, why, should, the, why should the work of Christopher Hitchens have any more uh, have any more claim on my attention than the random poundings at a keyboard of a chimp? Well, isn't that a serious philosophical problem? No, it isn't. It as, isn't. as usually, uh, Lewis is uh, chewing much more than he uh, bites off. Uh, <laughs> as it happens, you know, I've had my DNA sequenced recently. You can get yours done too. Um, uh, you should. By the you way. had it done? Yeah, you can find uh, what we always suspected. You know, I'm half a chromosome away from a chimpanzee, related also to plant and um, uh, vegetable and other matters, as well as other animals. And uh, I don't think evolution even knows that I'm here. Um, and I don't think that the Big Bang originated with me in mind. I'm sorry to say that I'm not as solipsistic and self-centered and arrogant as the religious would have me be. I don't think that these processes had me in mind or are aware of my presence. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make me feel that I can go and do anything I want. Why doesn't it? I don't know why it doesn't. Uh, but I do know, by counterexample, um, that if I put this problem to you, mm -hmm. name me an ethical action taken or a moral statement made by a believer that could not have been made or performed by a non-believer. I very much doubt you'll be able to do it. At least no one else has been able to yet. Give you time for it. No, no, if I, I asked any audience, right. can they think of a wicked action undertaken or a wicked statement made because of religion, nobody has a single second of hesitation before they can think of one. Mm -hmm. So you have advanced the argument not at all. In fact, you've, you've, you've again degraded it to the, to the view that we ought to believe foolish things, such as that we need divine permission to behave well, because if we didn't believe this, we might behave badly. Well, the facts are what they are, and the, and the fact is that no. no, actually, material does come first. But but I've already material, granted you. The, I've the already... mind the mind is a brain uh, before it's anything else. Of course, anyone who says that to the contrary is talking abject nonsense. No, but I think you, you're opening yourself to. Oh, all right, if you won't take it from Lewis, take it from Darwin. 
I'm quoting Charles Darwin now. Precisely the same point, by the way. With me, the horrid doubt always arises, Darwin writes in a letter, whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust in the convictions of a monkey's mind? Close quote. That's precisely the same point. If there's nothing but the material world, excuse me, I grant that we feel pangs of conscience. I grant that we all lead our lives as though reason, we take reason completely for yes. granted the way the, that we take the air we breathe. Yeah. It's there. With we nothing but the material it. world to go on. Ah, uh, but well, isn't that a clue? Any, you don't know of any other world. You only postulate it because you think it might be. Isn't easy. that a clue, though, that there's something outside us? Isn't there? Isn't rationality itself something outside us? Doesn't conscience? Isn't it a clue that there's something outside us? No, it's not. It's it's a it's it's to be reconciled as. You might call it surplus value, I suppose. If you say we, there were certain people who love others more than they need to, just for human solidarity. I mean, they're not altruistic people. Even as the large quite cranium right. that enables us to escape the tiger also enables Beethoven to compose piano sonatas. Yes. That's surplus value. Yes, it is surplus value. And uh, there are many, there are people who have always been celebrated, those who will live largely for the, the wider human family, or if you like, the wider, maybe it's more of a wider tribe, some who don't. Uh, those who do have always, have always been honored and respected, quite rightly, and there's no need to postulate anything supernatural about this. Mm. And since there's no evidence for anything supernatural, let alone any supernatural intervention in human affairs, I mean, none whatsoever of any kind, why make mysteries where none which, exist? Which we which have, we do have the spare capacity in our uh, uh, cranial wiring to care for other people in the hope that they will reciprocate, or, or, or maybe even without that hope. And when I give blood, say, mm. which I don't do often enough, it's, I, I get a positive pleasure out of doing it. I like doing it. I don't lose a pint. Mm -hmm. Somebody else gains one. Mm -hmm. That thought is very agreeable to me. I like it. I actually enjoy doing it. Um, I could add that I have a very rare blood group myself, and I may one day need a transfusion in my turn, and I hope other people have been doing it for me. But actually, no, it's not just for that reason, not just reciprocal. It's mm -hmm. now I, the, the, the idea that I need a supernatural prompting to think this way is. Um, no, you clearly I'm don't. I'm sorry, I, I think it's a barbaric idea question here, the, the purely utilitarian argument. By calling insulting reviewers who ask where you get your morals, you also deplore the, quote, the self-satisfaction that simply assumes whether or not religion is metaphysically true, that at least it stands for morality. But I'm not sure that argument is all that contemptible, as witnessed two pieces of evidence. George Washington, quote, of all the dispositions and habits which lead to the prosperity of a nation, religion is the indispensable support. It tends to lend itself toward a healthy polity. And the second is a kind of counterexample, which is the history of the 20th century, during which you have the communist regimes, that is to say, the regimes that were officially and aggressively atheist, caused the deaths of, you name the number, Bob Conquest, I think, is about 60 million, isn't it? 60 million of their own people, which dwarfs any number that um, the Crusaders may have uh, slain in, in the uh, 12th century. Well, I have a whole chapter about this in my book. Oh. Um, and. Uh, partly because I do think it's a very serious question. And I, I put it like this. First, um, the regimes of fascism and national socialism, the so-called Axis powers, who would be up in the same class of figures of mass murder, were, in the case of the uh, Mussolini-Franco forces, effectively nothing more than the right wing of the Roman Catholic Church. That's a, with that, You'll have to admit, church has itself had to admit, that whether it's Croatia, the Ustasha, mm. Hungary, the Arrow Cross. Croatia, so not less willing. But the, well, the, the, it's, the, it's effectively, it's, it's moved, the, the fascism, fascism the movement of the Catholic right. National socialism is pagan and in yes. some ways anti-clerical. I'm glad to hear you say that. Okay. Pagan and in some ways mm. anti-clerical, but it never breaks its concordat with the church. Right. The church reciprocates by having prayers by the order of the Vatican for Hitler's birthday every year till the very end, and then by rescuing even after the National Socialist regime, the Nazi regime was at an end, uh, helping its uh, wanted people to escape to other clerical fascist dictatorships in, in South America. This has all been attested many, many times and apologized for by the church, though I think not enough, um, to say nothing of the preachments down the years of anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And the third leader of the Axis, is at, the Japanese emperor, is actually a god, a god. To whom everyone knows, it. no one in Japan thought you could possibly have morality if you didn't agree that Hirohito was God. Where would morality come from? 
if we didn't have the emperor. We wouldn't know what to do. People would be screwing in the streets. Um, that's where it gets you. Well, now, Stalinism, because yeah, 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 I'm not ahead. ducking your question. All right. Okay, until 1917, millions of Russians have been told for millions of years, no, sorry, millions of Russians have been told for hundreds of years that the Tsar is the head of the church, mm -hmm. which he was, the Russian Orthodox Church, that the leader of the country should be something a little more than human. He's not a god, but he's a little more than, he's not quite divine, he's, he's a, a, holy, a holy father. Um, if you're Joseph Stalin, you shouldn't be in the dictatorship business if you don't know how to exploit an inheritance like that of millions of credulous, servile people. And what does he do? Lysenko's biology, miracles. Mm -hmm. We can have three harvests a year if we believe in Lysenko's biology. Inquisition, heresy hunt, orthodoxy. Everything comes from the top and must be thanked for and groveled for. Um, a complete replication of the, th of the preceding theocracy. For your, uh, for your argument to have any force at, I mean, any force at all, mm -hmm. you'd have to point to a society that adopted the teachings of Lucretius, uh, Spinoza, uh, Thomas Jefferson, Thomas Paine, um, Albert Einstein, um, and then fell into famine, dictatorship, uh, torture, and genocide. And you won't, I think, be able to point to such. You surely case, That's what you'd need for a level playing that's field. Very, so you, that's, that's slippery work. You should feel a pang now, I think. You're not going to say that what Stalin did to the uh, peasants in Ukraine was the fault of the Russian Orthodox Church. Well, the Russian Orthodox Church always was on his side. It, may have, it may have... It the Ukrainian Orthodox wouldn't have been at that point, but the Russian Orthodox Church, as you know, split because the, hi the hierarchy, the hierarchy stayed with his regime as it does with all such regimes, you because you have to, to render unto, have to render unto Caesar. You truly wish to blame the crimes of Joseph Stalin on Christianity? No, I, that would be slippery. No, I say uh, I was very careful to say, he, Stalin is gifted a legacy of backwardness, servility, and credulity inculcated by Christianity, mm -hmm. and he replicates the conditions of a political theocracy, and he keeps the church in his corner all throughout the war and throughout the, the collectivization. Look it up. The church had to split on the question. Those who didn't like it had to leave for America. And the religious mentality is very clearly shown in the totalitarian mass movements of leader worship and the Fuhrer Princip um, and their heresy hunts and, and uh, uh, proclamations of miracles. Yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's an allotropic form of the same thing. So if you want a, sec a society that is secular to be judged, you'll have to have one that is derived from the work of old Lucretius Galileo, uh, Spinoza, Einstein, and the rest. Percy Bysshe Shelley, 1792 to 1822. Sent down from Oxford for publishing a pamphlet entitled The Necessity of Atheism. Yes. Anti-monarchist. Uh, this is clear in a writing called Poetical Essay on the Existing State of Things, which was lost until 2006. Uh, Anti-monarchical tract. A proponent of what we would now call sexual liberation. Your kind of guy. All right. Listen to this. This is from a poem published after Shelley's death, dated about six months before his drowning. So it's dated June 1822. This low sphere and all that it contains contains not thee, thou whom seen nowhere I feel everywhere. In music and the sweet unconscious tone of animals and voices which are human, meant to express some feelings of their own in the soft motions and rare smile of woman, in flowers and leaves and in the grass fresh shown, or dying in the autumn, I the most adore thee present, or lament thee lost. Shelley, of all people, experiences deep intimations of the divine. What does Christopher Hitchens do with that fact? The common mistake, perhaps the commonest that made by, if you like, your side about mine, um, is that once we've said we were materialists, we've declared ourselves to be arid, um, pitiless, uh, no sense of the numinous or the transcendent. Um, this is something I think would, we could do another show on, on whether or not um, the natural world is wonderful enough, or the, on the beauties of science. On but are, but are, and so on. Are, are you saying that Shelley is simply mistaken here, that he's responding to something that doesn't exist? That is your point, isn't it? Oh, yeah, of course, yes. But I mean, the, the people do this all the time. All right. Um, it's a, it, look, uh, the, the, the belief that there is a transcendent, that it's, that it's divine, that it can be identified, worship, and so forth, is a very, very common delusion, and not only among poets. All right, so Shelley doesn't shake you. No, it takes a lot more than Shelley to shake me. 
Oh, would it? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought Shelley was precisely the kind of man to shake you. Right. No, Shelley, no, Shelley's politics and his romanticism don't, in fact, politically appeal to me very much Oh, at they all. don't? No, his... Oh, his, I thought um, I had you. I thought Shelley no, his, was just no, the his, man. I think his, his writings on atheism are, uh, are excellent and much better than that, I thought, rather indifferent kind. Mm. I didn't do justice to the poem, by the way. You have to read the whole thing. Right, but I don't, it doesn't seem to me in the same rank as his other poetry, for effect. Mm. All right. Well, uh, notice, notice, by the way, yes. how many poets write, um, as when poet laureates in England get the job from the Queen, as soon as they become the monarch's poet, they cease to write well. They just <laughs> don't do it. Um, religion often has the effect of, of making very intelligent, very sensitive people uh, talk the most terrible piffle. Oh, Hopkins, George? Oh, particularly Hopkins. Oh, Hopkins. Oh, no. <clears throat> not George Herbert and not John Donne, I must admit. But you I couldn't, don't like I couldn't be like without that. I don't like Hopkins at all. No. Really? And I, think, I also think that... Auden's uh, worst poetry is, is comes after his, his reconversion to Anglianism, as it happens. Auden's best poetry is all from his secular period. God is Not Great by Christopher Hitchens, for whom I shall be lighting a candle tomorrow. I'm Peter Robinson. This is Uncommon Knowledge. Thank you for joining us. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.